بسم الله والحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته Welcome to another session of Tafsir Al-Quran where we study the meaning of the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Today inshallah we're going to be looking at verse number ver, verses number 99, 100 and 101 we're going to be studying from verse number 99 through 101 of Surah Al-Baqarah, the second surah of the Qur'an. <clears throat> for anyone who's joining us for the first time or listening uh, for the first time, we started this series with Surah Al-Fatiha and then went into Surah Al-Baqarah and we are continuing with the goal and the objective to proceed throughout the entirety of the Qur'an. So up until now, our studies have brought us to the end of verse number 98. So inshallah, that's why we begin with ayah number 99 today. <clears throat> As always, uh, the way that we're going to approach this is I will recite the verses inshallah that we're going to be studying today. And then I will read, I will share what a translator has written about these particular verses. And from there, inshallah, we will delve further into the meaning uh, and a discussion in regards to the lessons, the wisdom that we can take from these verses of the Quran. A'udhu billahi min ash-shaytanir rajeem. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Wa laqad anzalna ilayka ayatin bayinat. Wa ma yakfuru biha illa al-fasiqoon. وَكُلَّمَا عَاهَدُوا عَهْدًا نَبَذَهُ فَرِيقٌ مِّنْهُمْ بَلْ أَكْثَرُهُمْ لَا يُؤْمِنُونَ وَلَمَّا جَاءَهُمْ رَسُولٌ مِّنْ عِنْدِ اللَّهِ مُصَدِّقٌ لِمَا مَعَهُمْ مُصَدِّقٌ لِمَا مَعَهُمْ نَبَذَ فَرِيقٌ مِّنَ الَّذِينَ أُوتُوا الْكِتَابَ كتاب الله وراء ظهورهم كأنهم لا يعلمون. A translator has written about these particular verses that we just recited, beginning with 99. For we have sent down clear messages to you, O Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And only those who defy God would refuse to believe in them. And for verse number 100, he writes, How is it that whenever they make a covenant or a pledge, some of them throw it away? In fact, most of them do not believe. And for verse number 101, he writes, When God sent them a messenger confirming the scriptures they already had, some of those who had received the scripture before threw the book of God over their shoulders as if they had no knowledge. So these are the verses that we recited, and that is a brief translation of them. We're going to go into a further discussion about exactly what these verses mean. As we always do, um, I feel that it's a good methodology, and it allows us to understand exactly what the verses are talking about, what they are addressing, and then we can actually discuss the language within the verse as well. I like to give you some background and kind of set the premise for what this is exactly and precisely speaking about. So first and foremost, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, here, what, what is being addressed, what these verses are addressing in terms of context, there's a narration from Abdullah ibn Abbas radiallahu ta'ala anhuma, he says that there was a man named Abdullah ibn Surya. And he said to the Prophet sallallahu Ya Muhammad, ma jitana bi shayin na'rifuhu. You have not brought anything to us that we recognize. Meaning what you have brought to us, we don't recognize it. It does not sound familiar at all. It doesn't seem to be connected or related to us in any way. وَمَا أَنزَلَ اللَّهُ عَلَيْكَ مِنْ آيَةٍ بَيِّنَةٍ And what God has given you, what you claim to be the scripture that you have brought, it does not seem to be very clearly laid out. 
So this was the kind of rhetoric that they were utilizing with the Prophet ﷺ. Furthermore, in another narration, it mentions about a man named Malik ibn Saif. He was also very commonly referred to at that time in the Medinan region as Ibn Saif. When the Prophet ﷺ came and delivered his message, and the Prophet ﷺ specifically mentioned the issue of the covenant. What is the issue of the covenant? The issue of the covenant is first and foremost, there is a covenant with all human beings, with all of our souls. Where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَإِذْ أَخَذَ رَبُّكَ مِنْ بَنِي آدَمَ مِنْ ذُهُورِهِمْ ذُرِّيَّتَهُمْ وَأَشْهَدَهُمْ عَلَىٰ أَنفُسِهِمْ That when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala pulled all the souls of all the human beings forth from, from all the children of Adam that were to come, and ask them, Alastu bi Rabbikum, am I not your Lord? Qalu bala shahidana. Rather, they all said, No, you are our Lord, and we testify to this fact. So that is one covenant. The other covenant that this speaks about is what is referred to, what, what is alluded to, what is referenced within the Quran. Where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَإِذَا خَدْنَا مِتَاقَ النَّبِيِّنَا لَمَا آتِيتُكُمْ مِنْ كِتَامٍ وَحِكْمَةٍ ثُمَّ جَاءَكُمْ رَسُولٌ مُصَدِّقٌ لِمَا مَعَكُمْ لَتُؤْمِنُنَّ بِهِ وَلَتَنْصُرُنَّهُ God took a covenant from all the prophets that if there comes during your lifetime, after you have been sent, a prophet and a messenger with the instruction and the guidance from Allah, لَتُؤْمِنُنَّ بِهِ you will indeed believe in him and you will help him and aid him and support him. Furthermore, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also says in Surah Al-A'raf, verse number 157, that those who follow the messenger and the prophet of God who was unlettered, that they indeed find him mentioned within the previous scriptures, the Torah and the Injil, that he was spoken about, that he was referenced, that they knew that he was coming. So when all these things were mentioned, the Prophet ﷺ came and, mentioned, and he mentioned all of these things, that this man, Ibn Sayf, he responds by saying, Wallahi ma ahida ilayna fi Muhammad. We have no obligation, we have no covenant in place that we have to believe in Muhammad. There was no promise or covenant that was taken from us that we have to accept or believe Muhammad and we have to believe in what he was sent down with. Furthermore, there's another narration as well that mentions that Ibn Abbas radiallahu ta'ala anhumah, he narrates this, that فَأَنْتَ تَتْلُوهُ عَلَيْهُمْ وَتُخْبِلُهُمْ بِهِ غَدْوَةً وَعَشِيَّةً وَبَيْنَ ذَلِكَ That, O oh Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, you are, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying that you recite the Qur'an and the revelation of God upon them morning and evening, all throughout the day. وَأَنْتَ عِنْدَهُمْ أُمِّيٌّ لَا تَقْرَأْ لَا تَقْرَأُوا كِتَابًا And you are unlettered, so you, it's not like you formally read and write. So all of this, this Qur'an cannot be a product of some kind of research or fabrication on your part. وَأَنْتَ تُخْبِرُهُمْ بِمَا فِي أَيْدِيهِمْ عَلَىٰ وَجِهِ And not only that, but you're able to confirm so much of what is in their scripture as well. يَقُولُ اللَّهُ تَعَالَى فِي ذَلِكَ لَهُمْ عِبْرَةٌ وَبَيَانٌ وَعَلَيْهِمْ حُجَّةٌ لَوْ كَانُوا يَعْلَمُونَ And this, in this, is a profound realization and a clarification and actually an establishment of proof against them if they only understood the reality of the issue and what they are actually doing to themselves. So this is the background that we're dealing with here is that these verses are being revealed in a situation, a circumstance where the Prophet ﷺ migrated from Mecca to Medina. 
And now he's not only speaking to people who are mushrikun, who worship idols, who have no concept of God, who have no concept of a religion and prophets and so on and so forth. But now the Prophet ﷺ is dialoguing with, he's having discourse with, he's calling to Islam a group of people who believe in scripture. They believe in revelation. They believe in prophets and messengers, the Jewish and the Christian communities. Ahlul Kitab. Very specifically, it was the Jewish community that resided there in and around the city of Medina. And in spite of the Prophet ﷺ coming to them with such a powerful message and such a clear um, understanding and with so much evidence and corroboration, but they are still, unfortunately and tragically, rejecting it and disbelieving in it and not taking heed at all. And that is what is being addressed here within these verses. Secondly, before we get started, um, once again, let's understand where we left off the discussion. In the previous verses, so many verses, Allah has been telling us about Bani Israel. More specifically, the people from the time of the Prophet Musa alayhi salam. And all the, you know, blessings they received and all the miracles that they witnessed and all the guidance and the message that was given to them. And then unfortunately, how they disobeyed time and time again. And they were warned repeatedly and yet they continuously went back to disobedience and defiance. And they were not compliant. And very recently, in the previous session, we also talked about how even at the time of the Prophet ﷺ, they were making all kinds of ridiculous excuses about why would why they would not believe in the Prophet ﷺ. Claiming things like, well, Jibreel, Gabriel, brings revelation to you and he is our enemy, and so on and so forth. So after all these things, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala here in this Play in these verses that we're studying here today, the three verses, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling the Prophet that when they oppose you, when they reject your message, when they make all types of these very bizarre arguments, they have a personal grudge against the angel Jibreel. What? What does that even mean? When they make all these kinds of excuses and all these kinds of arguments, understand how the he that this is their reality. That their reality is exposed in the verses that we're reading today. That it actually has nothing to do with any of the excuses they make or any of the objections that they have. It really just fundamentally has to do with the fact that they don't want to accept the truth. They are either arrogant or ignorant or just downright lazy or too self-absorbed and self-involved too invested into the status and the wealth and the power and the material means that they have developed around themselves. And furthermore, probably a combination of all of the above. That that's actually why they don't believe. And furthermore, it also provides consolation to the Prophet ﷺ to say that, number one, you're not doing anything wrong. You're doing everything perfectly by the book. Literally. Number two, your methodology and your approach is even sound. You don't need to amend your approach for these people. The Prophet said, is the most beautiful approach. Uswatun Hasana. Right? So he had the most beautiful approach. But rather, you are not the first to be rejected by them. If it did not align with their own personal motives and agenda. You're not the first to be rejected by them. But this is a very regular common tactic that they used whenever they weren't getting what they wanted, what they desired. So with all of that in mind, let's go into the actual verses and inshallah try to understand uh, what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying and how he says what he's saying, um, you know, with some level of depth and nuance. 
First of all, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala begins by saying, وَلَقَدْ That is a, a device that is used in classical Arabic and is very common throughout the Qur'an. And it brings a lot of emphasis with it. And it carries the connotation, because it's called Lamul Qasam, it carries the connotation of God is swearing by this. This is a confirmed fact. This is the reality of the matter. There's no doubt about what is being said. So what does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala say? Anzalna ilayka ayat and We have sent down to you, O Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, very clear signs. Now, what does that exactly mean? What did Allah send down to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? So it says signs because generally there are a lot of different things. There is the Quran, the revelation. There are understandings of the world and the reality. There are different moments of divine inspiration given to the Prophet ﷺ that was not necessarily specifically the Qur'an. So that's where it uses a more general language of signs and verses. But we do know that the main thing revealed down to the Prophet ﷺ was the Qur'an. That's the centerpiece of all of it. That's the core and nucleus of all of it. The Quran. So why does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala here not say Quran, but he says verses or signs? Well, because the Quran is compiled and comprised of verses. The Quran consists of verses. So therefore, it's accurate to say verses. Number two is that even signs that point you to belief in God, in the life of the hereafter, in the oneness of Allah, that that's what primarily what the Quran communicates. That's the primary objective of the Quran. That every single messenger was messenger that was sent was sent with the message that there's no one worthy of worship except for Allah alone. And Allah says, worship only me. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, we sent down to you very clear signs and proofs. The Quran, revelation. And it says beginat, very, very clear. That is self-evident in its clarity. And that's why it says then that the only one who would disbelieve in those things are people who are defiant. People who are defiant, insolent, belligerent against Allah, against God. That those are the only people that would disbelieve. Now there's a little bit of a discussion here that's a very fascinating discussion. And that is about this concept. There's a word here that Allah uses, which is fisk. Fisk. The word fisk, linguistically in the Arabic language, is khurujul insan amma huddalahu. That is for a human being to go outside of the boundaries that have been set for the human being. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says about Iblis Shaytan in Surah 17, Ayah 50, that Illa Iblis akana min al-jinni fa fasaqa an amri rabbihi That he went outside of the obedience of his Lord. So, furthermore, how exactly is this word fisq used? Like fasiq, fasiqun, as the verse says. Then people who commit minor infractions and minor sins, that word is not used for them. Right? That rather the word fisk is used for very serious violations. When someone does something very serious and commits a major violation. And furthermore, إِذَا عَظُمَ taaddi, When the transgression is very severe. And that's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uses the word fasiq here, that the only people who disbelieve are true fasiqun. Why? Because each and every single person who disbelieves in God is indeed crossing the line. But not everyone who crosses the line necessarily disbelieves in Allah. Furthermore, the second thing is that 
When a person ends up disbelieving in Allah, doing something that heinous, that severe, that serious, where they straight up disbelieve in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it's not like somebody just jumps to that particular level, but that person starts crossing the line and crossing the boundary and eventually starts living outside of the boundaries that Allah has set. And that's how a person eventually becomes desensitized and is able to then do something as unbelievable, unfathomable, reprehensible as kufr, as disbelief. And that's why a person does something that is so outside the bounds of what spiritually makes sense and what even logically makes sense, that they disbelieve in the one who gave them everything, who created them. But a person gets to that particular point after living this continuous existence of defiance and disobedience of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In the next verse, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah says, that whenever they make a covenant, whenever they make a promise, whenever they give their word about anything, there's always a group amongst them. And the commentators say that it actually eventually ended up being the majority of them. That a huge section of them ends up discarding it. But rather, most of them, they actually don't end up believing. So the verse corroborates that itself. But it specifically says they make a covenant, they give their word, they make a promise, they take an oath, they make a commitment, and then they throw it. Nabadahu, they throw it. So what is this exact idea of a nabdu? Right? What does this exactly mean? So in the Arabic language, in the Arabic language, this word nabd, means tarhu shay. It means to throw something, to toss something. And exactly what does that signify? What that signifies, as um, the scholars of the Arabic language tell us, that that signifies that someone does not care about something. That it's kind of like how you would throw something away in the trash can is because it did not have any significance to you. And that's why you were comfortable throwing it away. And so that's what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says when he says you th they throw it away. Because in the Arabic language, in classical Arabic, as a euphemism, Imam Razi explains that as a euphemism, as an expression, when you would talk about somebody breaking their oath, breaking their promise, breaking their word, that would be referred to as nabdul ahad, throwing away the covenant, which means you defied it, you violated it, you threw it away, you did not care for it. But akhtarhum la yu'minun, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, rather most of them, they just don't believe. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَلَمَّا جَاءَهُمْ رَسُولٌ مِّنْ عِنْدِ اللَّهِ And when finally there came to them a messenger, from Allah, a messenger from Allah, sent by Allah. Now, the um, some of the uh, scholars of the Quran who focus on and talk about the balagha, the eloquence of the Quran, they ask a question here. Rasul, this is the Quran, it's a well-established concept here in the Quran, that a Rasul, a messenger, is sent by Allah. But why does it specifically say Rasulun min indillah? A messenger coming specially from God, specifically from Allah. Why mention that min indillah? So the scholars of tafsir they explain that wusifar rasulu bi annahu atim min indillahi li ifadati mazid al ta'zim. That the explicit mention of the fact, while already being an established fact, that the messenger comes from Allah, is to grant even more dignity and more esteem and more prestige and more honor to the messenger of Allah. To add even more weight and more gravity to what the messenger is bringing and what he is saying and what he is doing. That it adds that gravitas to the position and the place 
of a messenger, alayhi salam, peace and blessings be upon all of them. And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that ultimately then, when a messenger specially sent by Allah comes to them, and not only does he come there, مُصَدِّقُلِ مَا مَعَهُمْ He can directly corroborate what is in their scripture. He can talk about in a very informed way what is in their scripture. Because the Quran itself says, مُصَدِّقَلِ مَا بَيْنَ يَدَيْهِ مِنَ التَّورَاتِ That the Quran is confirming what is in their scripture. Then Allah says, نَبَذَ فَرِيقٌ مِنَ الَّذِينَ أُوتُوا الْكِتَابِ and here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala highlights something very specific. And this is where we're nearing the end of the passage we're studying. So we're going to talk about some, some food for thought, some reflections that we can take from this. Allah says specifically that not only does a group, once again, there's that word, throw it away, toss it aside. Not only does a group do that, but Allah specifically says, a group of the people who were given scripture before, who were given scripture previously, who were sent the books previously, a group of them tosses it aside and discards it. So the discarding is brought back here again, tossing something aside. We've spoken about what that means. That means that somebody is ignoring something. So that means somebody says, is basically communicating. They have no need for this. They have no use for this. All right? So we've already talked about that. But then it says, Specifically, it identifies people who have knowledge of the religions of the past, the scriptures of the past, the prophets of the past. And why does it specifically identify them? So Imam Razi, rahimahullah ta'ala, in his tafsir, he mentions two benefits, two understandings, two lessons that we can take from this. Number one is that it's specifically identifying the people who, while they might not be very, very knowledgeable, but nonetheless they ascribe to the religion, they ascribe to the scripture, they ascribe, they associate themselves with, they identify with, they say they believe in the scripture, whether it be the Torah or the Injil, the, the, the Torah or the Bible and the prophets, Musa and Isa, Moses and Jesus, alayhim as -salam. They, they say that they believe in those things. And then secondly, it also speaks to the people, مِمَّنْ أُوْتِيَ عِلْمَ الْكِتَابِ مَنْ يَدْرُسُهُ وَيَحْفَظُهُ that the person who studies the scripture of the past, the person who learns the scripture of the past, who has memorized parts of the scripture, who discusses it, reads it, talks about it, researches it, has knowledge. That somebody who has real knowledge of the scripture, they cannot, it is impossible that they would read the Quran and not recognize the fact that this is from Allah. Somebody would have knowledge of the scripture, it is impossible that they would interact with the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and not recognize and realize that he is indeed the messenger of Allah. That is impossible. So that's why Allah calls them out specifically. Those people who should know better, who have the benefit of knowing better, unfortunately they toss aside the message of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu in the Qur'an. And then Allah says, Kitab Allahi wa ra'adhuhurihim. That their reality, remember I told you that this is going to speak about what their reality is. Their reality is that the message of Allah, the scripture of Allah, the religion of Allah, the teachings of the prophets of Allah, all of that is sitting behind their backs. They put their backs to it. Now what does that mean? What does that mean that they put their backs to it? What exactly does that refer to? So Imam, uh, Imam Al-Qurtubi rahmallahu ta'ala, he mentions, هَذَا مَثَلٌ يُدْرَوُ لِمَنْ اسْتَخَفَّ بِالشَّيْءِ فَلَا يَعْمَلْ بِهِ That this is a euphemism, an expression, a metaphor in the Arabic language for someone who makes light of something, does not take, does not take something very seriously, and has no plans 
has no uh, plans of actually acting on it. And then he goes on to tell us that the Arabs would say, "Ij'al hada khalfa dharik, wa dubran minka, wa tahta qadamik." That if somebody was telling you to ignore something, like let's say somebody is attacking you, someone is slandering you, someone is saying something rude to you, and if I was telling you ignore that, don't pay any attention to that, pay no heed to that. That in old Arabic, the way that it would be said is put it behind your back. Turn your back to him. Put it under your feet. And what that basically means is ignore it. Pretend like it doesn't exist. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, وَاتَّخَدْتُمُوهُ وَرَاءَكُمْ ذِهْرِيًا You put it behind your backs. Al-Farra, a very famous poet of the Arabic language and some of the muhaqiqeen, some of the researchers, they say that this couplet actually is uh, was said was written by Al-Farazdaq, who was a very famous poet, that he said to Tamim ibn Zayd, Tamim ibn Zaydin, لا تكونن حاجتي بظهر فلا يعلى علي جوابها. That he's telling him that do not put my needs and my request that I present to you behind your back because then you will forget to answer me. Right? Do not put my request behind your back because then you'll forget to answer me. Right? Maybe a modern day poet would say, Do not leave me on red because then you will forget to respond to me. All right? So, nonetheless, that is the concept here that Allah says that, Wara'akum uh, dhihriya. Right? Kitab Allahi wara'a dhuhurihim. They have put the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala behind their backs. Turn their backs on it, completely ignoring it. Completely and totally ignoring it. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, كَأَنَّهُمْ لَا يَعْلَمُونَ It's as if they never even understood it to begin with. It's as if they never really even knew it. Talking about even their own scripture. Talking about even their own religion talking about even the teachings of the prophets that they do claim to believe in. And that's really the issue here. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is highlighting by rejecting the Prophet sallallahu what they actually expose, by refusing to believe in the Prophet sallallahu what they actually expl- uh, expose and disclose that they never really even truly believed in the prophets that they claimed to believe in and follow. By rejecting and not believing in the Qur'an, what they truly disclose and expose about themselves is that they never really even properly read and believed in and followed the scripture, the revelation that was sent to them before. When they reject the deen, the Qur'an, the revelation, the whole religion of Islam, that actually exposes that they never really believed in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to begin with. And that is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says here, كَأَنَّهُمْ لَا يَعْلَمُونَ It's as if they never even knew anything. It's like talking to a wall. Qatada rahimahullahu ta'ala says, إِنَّ الْقَوْمَ كَانُوا يَعْلَمُونَ That they, they knew. They had quite a bit of knowledge and uh, understanding. But then, وَلَكِنَّهُمْ نَبَذُوا عِلْمَهُمْ But they themselves threw their own knowledge away. وَكَتَمُوهُ وَجَحَدُوا بِهِ And they would conceal their knowledge and they would deny having the knowledge. If it meant that they did not have to accept the authority of the Qur'an and the Prophet ﷺ within their lives. As I said before when we started, this ultimately always boils down to ego and desire and worldly ambition, and that is what gets in the way. Now to conclude here, I wanted to mention just a couple of more things. Some of the lessons that we can take from this. Number one, first and foremost, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he tells us the first lesson that we can derive from this is refusal. The, and these are three things that I'm going to point out that we need to be very careful about. Y'all are familiar by now, those who have been following the Tafsir series, 
you understand that even when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is talking about the nations of the past, the disbelievers, so on and so forth, there's always a lesson for us in it. There's always something for us to reflect upon and to see how it reflects upon us and how we can pay heed to this. So there are three things that I'll highlight. Number one, refusal. This kind of denial and refusal. Arrogance, ignorance, and just refusing something. Because you don't like it or you don't know it, just refusing something. But rather a believer must always have a very open-minded, open-hearted approach to knowledge and understanding. That when someone says, قَالَ Allah, قَالَ Rasul, God has said, the messenger has said, that my ears, my ears must perk up, my eyes must open up wide, my heart needs to open up to embrace what I am about to get. That that needs to be the attitude. And refusal and denial, rejection is a very negative trait and a very detrimental quality. Number two is treachery. Treachery. What do I mean by that? They were described as every single time they make a covenant, they give their word, they, they, give their word, they break it. In Surah Al-Anfal, Surah number eight, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks about this. And that kind of behavior in the Quran, where uh, with that kind of behavior Allah describes it in the Quran. In the that the most evil creatures in the eyes of God on the face of this earth are those who disbelieve and they do not, they refuse to believe. The ones that you make a promise and a covenant with, you sit down with them, you negotiate with them, you talk to them in good faith. And then what do they do? They break their promise every single time. They never keep their word. They have no consciousness of God. That most of them seem to be very deceitful and treacherous and dishonest and lack honesty and integrity. So speaking of that, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala warns us again, being warns us against being treacherous. I've spoken about this previously, but the Prophet وسلم, tells us, La imana li man la amana talahu, wa la dina li man la ahda lahu. That person who cannot be trusted has no faith. That person who cannot keep their word has no deen, has no religion. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us, wa la hum li amanatihim wa ahdihim ra'un. That those who take who keep their trust and their promises. And then the third thing, the third thing, and this is very, very important to pay attention to, and that is to not be selective in what we will obey and what we will not obey. I'm not talking about making mistakes and falling short and forgetting and making mistakes. We ask Allah, forgive us for our shortcomings. When we forget and make mistakes. Because to err is human. All human beings make mistakes. But the best of those are the ones who repent. That's fine. We'll all make mistakes. But there's a difference between that and very selectively going about the religion. Deciding what you will obey and will not obey. That's very dangerous. We spoke about it before. We spoke about that before, but that gets brought up once again right here because they are calling themselves followers of Musa, followers of Isa, adherents of uh, the religion of Allah, Ahlul Kitab, Alladina Utul Kitab, that they believe and follow in the scripture, in the revelation. But then they turn around and reject anything to do with the Prophet ﷺ in the Qur'an. And that shows that selectiveness. And that is very, very problematic. That is very, very dangerous. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in the Qur'an, وَلَوْ آمَنَ أَهْلُ الْكِتَابِ لَكَانَ خَيْرُ لَهُمْ Had they believed in the Qur'an and the Prophet ﷺ, that would have been better for them. Well, there are some who do believe, most of them do not believe. And 
This is not only about them, but that's something we need to be reflect. We need to reflect upon ourselves. What is my attitude? What is my approach with my religion, the Quran, the life of the Prophet, the Sunnah of the Messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? What is my approach with that? Sufyan ibn Uyayna, rahimallahu ta'ala, the great scholar from the early generations of hadith and fiqh, he says something about this verse and about what is mentioned here, this kind of selective mentality in this verse that this verse tells us about they had. He says, Speaking about the previous nations, their scriptures, They wrote it and wrapped it in cloth of fine silk. And they adorned the outside of their scripture with gold and silver. They wrote it with ink of gold. They wrapped it in silk. They ornamented it with silver and jewels. But, وَلَمْ يُحِلُّوا حَلَالَهُ When their scripture said, this is a permissible, then they did not recognize its permissibility. وَلَمْ يُحَرِّمُوا حَرَمَهُ And when their religion, their scripture, the deen, told them that something was haram, they did not accept it, they did not recognize it, they did not abide by it. وَلَمْ يُحَرِّمُوا حَرَمَهُ فَذَلِكَ النَّبْذُ That is discarding the revelation from Allah. And we need to reflect on ourselves that this Quran written here so beautifully in this decoration, in this artwork with uh, such ornamentation, that's fine, that's good, that's nice. But if that's the only role that the Quran serves in my life, is this art decorated on the wall? Or if I have a very nice fancy mushaf and I put it up on a high shelf, but then I don't actually live my life by it. I don't respect what it says about right and wrong. Then I can put it on a fancy piece of artwork, a canvas. I can put it on the shelf. But in effect, effectively, I've thrown it away. I've done the same exact thing that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala condemned here in this verse about the nations of the past. And that's something we really got to think about. It's to take this Quran very seriously and to take our deen and our religion very seriously. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us all the ability to practice everything that we've said and heard. Subhanallah wa bihamdihi. Subhanakallahumma wa bihamdik. Nashhadu wa la ilaha illa anta. Nasaghfiruka wa natubu ilayk. So insha'Allah, um, we have about 10 minutes. Um, so as is the... Um, process every week, inshallah, um, I will try to answer any, you know, any questions y'all might have. I can't promise I'll be able to answer the questions, um, but inshallah, I can, I can try, or y'all can ask your questions and I will see inshallah. All right. Um, as always, um, just, uh, I always mention and just kind of, you know, uh, reach out to. Uh, specifically the brothers and sisters in the um, South Lake community, ICS, Islamic Center of South Lake, all the families there, all of our friends there. Um, it's the community that typically on a weekly basis would host this Tafsir class there in person uh, ever since the you know, uh, lockdown and the restrictions with COVID went into effect going back a few months now. We haven't been able to have this Tafsir class there in person. Uh, so we've been doing it online, but nonetheless, um, we welcome them to the broadcast every week as we also open it up to everyone else. Uh, and we look forward to seeing them again uh, and seeing all of y'all again. So may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alleviate this situation and allow us to be able to congregate again together in person and be able to study the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala together. Also, I wanted to very quickly mention to everyone that insha'Allah, alhamdulillah, from tomorrow is the first day of the month of Dhul Hijjah. Uh, Thursday, not this Thursday, the next Thursday, um, which I believe 
will be the 29th. Um, no, excuse me, the 30th. Excuse me, the 30th of July. So today is the first day of the month of the Hijjah. The 30th of July, which is going to be next Thursday, uh, that will be the day of Arafah. So we will fast on that day. We'll have a tafsir class before then, so I'll remind you all again. But that is a day of fasting. The Prophet ﷺ recommended it. And then Friday, the 31st, will be the day of Eid, Eid al-Adha. Also, as it is the month of the Hijjah, it's a time of good deeds and reward and therefore charity. And giving in the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is one of the greatest deeds that one can do. So alhamdulillah, qalam, as we are providing all this education that you see, alhamdulillah, to the whole community, wherever you may be, um, we have a campaign asking people to contribute to the work that qalam does so that we can continue to educate more and more people all around the world without any barriers to education at all. Um, so we ask you to contribute. If you go to supportqalam.com, you can donate, you can contribute, you can be a part of the work that we do and secure your sadaqa jariya during the blessed 10 days of the month of the hijjah by which the Prophet ﷺ said, there are no days in which good deeds are more beloved to Allah than these 10 days of the month of the hijjah. So inshallah, go to supportkalam.com and be a part of the good work that we're doing. Inshallah, bidnillah. All right. So as I was saying, if there are any questions then inshallah I will make an attempt to try to address those questions inshallah. All right, so we have um, some questions here. We have multiple questions from someone. The Hijjah, Amin. Okay, not intending to seek knowledge, does that make one fall into the category of rejecting that knowledge or are you excused as an ignorant person? So when it comes down to the fundamentals of the religion, then ignorance is no longer an excuse. While I would not say that the person is now rejecting the knowledge of the religion, but they are definitely negligent. There's a big difference between, there is a difference between rejection and negligence. Negligence is just a person distracted, careless, whatever the case may be, lazy, as I said before, um, versus rejection is like knowingly just, you know, discarding it. So there is a difference. There will be a sin for negligence, but it's not quite as severe as a sin of rejection. So someone's asking a very good question, and that is, um, how should we go about in finding an Islamic teacher if we want someone as a teacher and a mentor? Um, so remember that if you if you kind of put too much of an, in terms of expectations from the very beginning and from the very get go, then you're not allowing something to develop as time kind of goes on. So I would the mentor part of it. Those are built out of relationships, and that will come with its time. But as far as the teacher is concerned, then there are a couple of things. Number one, and a couple of things that should be taken into consideration. Number one is that there are near teachers and more distant teachers. More distant teachers are people whose works you benefit from, whether it's a classical scholar who wrote works that we're studying, the tafsir of Imam Qurtubi, the Sahih of Imam Bukhari, Sharh Ma'ani al of Imam Tahawi, right? Faith al-Bari of Anwar Shah Kashmiri, right? Sahih Muslim, etc., etc. So these are people that I am benefiting from their knowledge. So it's kind of like somebody distant that you are benefiting from their knowledge. These lectures, these sessions are similar to that. I am distant from you. And, you know, we're trying to benefit from one another in that sense. So that's one thing. But in terms of having a personal teacher, right, a muallim, a mudarris, an ustad, somebody you are benefiting from personally, then that 
has a few things that you uh, need to be mindful of. Even for someone that you benefit from from a distance, you should, of course, make sure they are qualified. But particularly when it comes to up-close learning, number one, qualifications are a must. Qualifications are a must. Now, how do you judge? You don't judge someone's qualifications. You don't have to. But you just look at what is typically the standard of qualification for someone to be a qualified, competent teacher and leader. And that should never be compromised on. Never, ever compromise on that. I don't care how nice somebody seems. I don't care what it seems like they have to offer. It doesn't matter in terms of how eloquent or fantastic it sounds, what they're saying. Qualifications are must. All right. So um, somebody who never had a teacher can never have real students. So qualifications are very important. Just like you wouldn't go to somebody for medical advice who wasn't qualified. So how should, why would you trust your religion to somebody who wasn't qualified? Number two is that um, their character should be something that inspires you. Nobody's perfect after the Prophet ﷺ, nobody's perfect. But their character should indeed inspire you. There's that That's definitely doable, right? That you look at them and you look at their character and you're like, wow, mashallah, that, that's, that's admirable. I can appreciate that, okay? And number three is accessibility. Of course, you don't want to pin your hopes on trying to learn from someone who's not accessible to you. Accessibility also needs to be taken into consideration. I hope that makes sense. Um, let's see here. Someone's asking a very good question. Can you make up sunnah prayers when you're in the process of making up prayers from the past? You definitely can. The more you do, the better it is for you, but you don't have to. That's the key part. You don't have to. But if you'd like to, absolutely. Welcome. Ahlan wa sahlan. The more, the merrier. The more you do, the better it is. Inshallah. Is quantity better than quality during these 10 days, like reciting many surahs, instead of learning tafsir? That really depends on the situation. What I typically tell people is both. Do both. Have certain goals in terms of quantity, and then have certain, some time set aside for quality. So have goals for quantity and time for quality. And that way you do both. So if you're going to make, you know, an hour a day for the Qur'an during these 10 days... Split your time. Half an hour, you're just reading to try to get done as much as you can. And then half an hour, you'll sit and maybe watch a video like this, read some from tafsir from somewhere, and just try to deepen your understanding of the Qur'an. All right. With that, inshallah, we will conclude here. Uh, as I said before, inshallah, please go to supportcolumn.com. Check it out. Uh, we have a ton of... Beneficial resources on the Qalam website. So inshallah, go there and check it all out. Uh, and as inshallah, uh, we proceed into the days of the Hijjah, we're going to be making some very cool announcements. Uh, on the day of Arafah, we're going to be having a very special event with all the Qalam instructors. And starting from tomorrow night, Ustad Abdurrahman Murphy and myself and I, we will be doing a nightly reflection series, inshallah, throughout the 10 days of the month of the Hijjah. I look forward to seeing you all then. Jazakumullahu khairan. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu.